All right, I want to make a quick little video here as a reply to a letter that we received recently. Uh, this was addressed to the church that I'm part of, Bible Believers Fellowship. And it's from a man by the name of Kevin. That's all I know about him. Um, didn't re didn't uh, put his return address there, so there's no way to get in contact with him. And he signed this letter as Kevin. No address, no email, nothing. Which is pretty cowardly in my opinion. But I want to make this uh, video as a rebuttal. I don't really know how else I can rebut this. Not only to this guy, Kevin. Hopefully, somehow you can watch this. If you check out our website, maybe you're on our website and you're looking at this thing right now. This is a rebuttal to you if you are watching it. But this is also an answer to a lot of the other modern Christian, professing Christians out there. Um, because a lot of them have the same type of mentality. Now, as I stated in another video, we put a lot of these out. We put thousands of them out over the last year or two. Uh, it's a lot of information in a door hanging bag. We hang it on doorknobs. We sometimes we get to talk to the people, knock on the doors, whatever. Um, but he received one of these packets, and basically, for the first two paragraphs, he goes into um, saying that he agrees with us. But then he goes and he says he doesn't agree with us on two issues, versions of the Bible and Christian music. Now, I just want to read a verse very quickly here, what I'm going to do. I'm not going to treat you, Kevin, or any other modern professing Christian. I'm not going to treat you as an enemy. I'm going to admonish you. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Okay, that's what I'm going to do in this video. First you're going to get a reproof, then a rebuke, and now I'm going to exhort you. So let's start out here with this uh, versions of the Bible. He says here, what we don't agree on, and trust me, I prayed relentlessly on these issues. Let me just stop right there for one second. That seems to be a thing that a lot of Christians do now. Well, I prayed about it, I prayed about it, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. Listen. You can pray all day long about something and not submit to the authority of Scripture and not submit to the facts. And you can pray yourself out of conviction and say, well, I feel that the new versions are better than the King James Version. I prayed about it. Yeah, but you didn't look at the, the, the facts. You didn't research the Scriptures. So that doesn't mean anything to me. Okay? Number one, he says here, versions of the Bible. You claim you can prove all other versions are corrupt. I can prove that they are not. For example, go, for example, go to Luke 2.1. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. By historical fact, Caesar Augustus did not have control of all the world. Now let me just stop for a second. Now, this is a common attack, which is used by enemies of the Bible. Seems kind of strange that you would use this heaven or any other modern professing Christian, but the fact is, it's not a contradiction, it's not an error. You see, if you actually read the verse, it says, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. It doesn't say that he taxed all the world. It says that he took a paper and a pen or whatever, and he wrote a decree saying that all the world should be taxed. Okay, all the world was what he knew he controlled. A lot of these guys saw the ocean going out that way and they said it's all just water. They didn't know about other countries and other continents out there. So there's no error in the Bible there. Okay, world is the correct translation. But let's go back to the letter here. He says, and therefore the Greek word, and I don't know how to pronounce that, whatever, which is often translated as world, but can also, also can mean land or region, should have been translated as land or region. Now, I did a little bit of research here. You can see beside me 30 modern perversions, okay? 30 of them. And he says that it should be land. It's mistranslated, you know, as, as world, and it should be land. Out of these 30 modern versions, NIV, New American Standard, New King James, New Living Translation, I got tons of them here. I only went through 30 because I don't have time to waste much time on this kind of stuff. Out of all these 30 translations... How many of them do you think said land? Zero. 
None. None of them said land. Okay? So then, apparently, Kevin, you must be much more intelligent than all the Bible translators of the last almost 400 years. I haven't been able to find one Bible that says land. You don't know what you're talking about, okay? Now you're getting some rebuke here, and you better take it. You better realize and submit to the fact you are not a scholar. You are not a man that has any right to say that it's mistranslated, okay? You don't know what you're talking about. It's not an error, number one, and in number two, it's not a mistranslation. Okay, now he goes on to say, in the, pre in the preface of the original King James Version of 1611, the 150 scholars, okay, and I'll, I'll finish here, he says, assigned to the tremendous task of translating the first English Bible, stated that they had done their best to make a factual translation, but there would be discrepancies that each reader should search out for himself. Okay, I want to make two points. First of all, if you actually studied the issue, here we have Which Bible Can We Trust by, trust by Les Garrett, page 31, 54 men. Okay, and you can look it up time and time again. Some will say 47, some say 54, 57. The point is, there were about an average of 54 men who worked on the translation of the King James Version. It took seven years. Um, 1604 to 1611, and there were some men that died during the process, there were some men that dropped out, whatever, but the point is, it was not 150. You don't know what you're talking about. Again, you show your ignorance of this subject. But secondly, to say, making this claim that the translators said that it was imperfect or something like this, where's the proof of that? And even if they said it, who says that they were without error? Okay, their translation is perfect, but, you know, the, I mean, the apostles made mistakes. They weren't sinless. Who would say that the translators were sinless? I certainly don't believe that way. Their product was perfect. The King James Bible is perfect because God had his hand on it. Now, what they wrote personally, well, you know, whatever. Again, you're not proving the point. On to the next paragraph. We must give credit to those early scholars, for they had paved the way for future translations of other languages and versions alike. We wouldn't have these other translations if it were not only for them, but also the Holy Spirit. Now, again, you show your ignorance. What you don't realize, apparently, is that there are two different Bibles. I have here a Textus Receptus, I have here a Nestle's text. They're not the same Bible. This one is from Alexandria, Egypt. This one is from Antioch, where they were called Christians first. Acts 11.26. There are two Bibles. And the King James Version is the last one of the Textus Receptus Bibles. All Bibles produced since 1881 come from this corrupt text based on less than 1% of the extant Greek manuscripts. Okay? You don't know what you're talking about. It's not that these new versions are an updated King James Bible. No, the new versions are from a different area of the world. There are two Bibles. The correct Bible and the corrupt Bible over here. You don't know what you're saying. And then he goes on here in the next, next couple of lines to talk about the unpardonable sin and blaspheming the Holy Ghost, kind of implying that I might, you know, I'm borderline doing it. But here he says... Uh, we as Christians have to be willing to accept the ways of the Holy Spirit, even if, if it makes us uncomfortable with change. <laughs> oh, brother. We all speak modern English, including our British counterparts. No one speaks Elizabethan English anymore. Hey, they didn't speak King James English back then in 1611. I have books quoting William Tyndale, and he speaks differently. And William Tyndale was 1520s. And he speaks differently. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay? But it says, and, I, and here's another one of the modern lines that's used so many times. No one speaks Elizabethan English anymore. The truth is this. God's word has been and always will be preserved. Okay, smarty pants, where is it? 